In Mexico, the grip of drug cartels on the streets was unyielding, their power extending through violent means and corrupt ties to politics. The illicit drug trade flourished, raking in billions while instilling fear in the populace. Yet, as drug-related violence surged across different territories, the government responded with a resolve to enforce the rule of law. This endeavor saw the rise of anti-drug police units and military interventions, resulting in intense clashes with cartel members. This clash of forces, however, had unintended consequences as civilians became caught in the crossfire, leading to a cycle of attacks and street encounters. Join us as we explore the gangs who defied Mexican cartels and the bloodshed that followed. La Familia Michoacana First up on our list is the La Familia Michoacana, which is also known as La Familia, and has a formidable presence in the territories of Michoacana, Mexico. Although a drug cartel presently, La Familia was started as a vigilante group for protecting the weak and impoverished groups of Michoacana. Originating as a group of vigilantes determined to counter kidnappers and drug dealers, this organization's journey took an unexpected turn, catapulting it into the ranks of the most formidable criminal cartels in Mexico. Through a blend of religious ties, violent tactics, and strategic alliances, La Familia emerged as a powerful and enigmatic force in the nation's drug war. La Familia's genesis can be traced back to the 1990s when it served as the Gulf Cartel's paramilitary arm. Its primary goal was to wrest control of the illicit drug trade in Michoacan state from rival cartels. Initially, the group received training from Los Cetas, but it eventually forged its path, operating independently as a drug trafficking entity. What started as a response to protect their community from criminal intruders soon transformed into something more menacing. Fueled by its reputation and success in thwarting external threats, La Familia seized the opportunity to expand its reach and consolidate power. Capitalizing on its myth, the organization transitioned from a vigilante group to a fully-fledged criminal gang. Under the leadership of Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, also known as El Mas Loco, and later Jose de Jesus Mendez Vargas, known as El Chango Mendez, La Familia unleashed a wave of violence. Utilizing brutal tactics like murder and torture to dominate their rivals and secure control over Mikoacan. Unique aspect of La Familia was its quasi religious characterization. Leaders like Moreno Gonzalez and Mendez Vargas justified their gruesome actions as divine justice. The cartel exhibited connections to the New Jerusalem religious movement, which underscored the significance of justice related issues. In an unprecedented move, Moreno Gonzalez authored his Bible, blending evangelical style self help with insurgent peasant slogans. Slogans. This blend of religion and ideology had a profound impact on the group's recruits, incorporating notions of a battle to fight, a beauty to rescue, and an adventure to live. La Familia's criminal enterprises extended beyond drug trafficking. It branched into various illicit operations, including extortion, kidnapping, unlicensed DVD distribution, and human smuggling to the United States. The cartel even provided loans to local farmers, businesses, schools, and churches, using social support as a means of consolidating influence. Notorious for its violent actions, La Familia left a trail of bloodshed in its wake. It exhibited a penchant for showcasing its brutality by resorting to decapitations and public displays of violence. While its criminal activities surged, the Mexican government refused to engage in dialogue with the cartel, opting for a direct confrontation and law enforcement strategy. Confrontations with law enforcement, however, brought human rights charges against the military, further complicating the fight against the cartel. La Familia Michoacana's transformation from vigilantes to a criminal powerhouse reflects the intricate and often perplexing dynamics of Mexico's drug war. Its combination of religious fervor, strategic alliances, and violent tactics set it apart from other cartels, making it a formidable and mysterious force in the criminal landscape. The organization's impact continued to reverberate throughout Michoacan and Guerrero, exemplifying the far-reaching consequences of cartel activities in Mexico. As we delve further into the narratives of other gangs that dared to stand against Mexican cartels, we gain a deeper understanding of the complexities and dangers surrounding these criminal organizations. Stay tuned for more revelations in our ongoing series. The decline of La Familia Michoacana marked a significant shift in the Mexican drug landscape. After the alleged death of its leader, Nazario Moreno Gonzalez, in 2010, the cartel faced internal strife and a splintering of its leadership. This fragmentation led to the emergence of new criminal organizations, including the Knights Templar Cartel, formed by former La Familia leaders Enrique Plancart Solis and Servando Gomez Martinez. Despite the upheaval, La Familia Michoacana continued to engage in criminal activities, albeit with reduced prominence. By 2020, the cartel's influence had significantly waned, and it had lost its foothold in the state of Guerrero. 
All 39 non-Jalisco New Generation cartels operating in Guerrero had splintered into smaller, less powerful factions, pointing to the cartel's diminishing presence in the region. The criminal landscape in Michoacán also experienced shifts, with the Knights Templar cartel taking over as one of the active criminal organizations in the state. Additionally, the cartel del Abuelo and Los Viagras emerged as significant players, further diversifying the competition for control in the area. The Jalisco New Generation cartel, a powerful and notorious criminal organization, also maintained its presence and influence in the region. Meanwhile, in the state of Mexico, criminal activity continued to be contested by various groups. Los Rojos, dissidents from the Beltran Leva organization, splinter groups from La Familia Michoacana, and criminal gangs from Mexico City were among the factions vying for power and territory. The activities of these criminal organizations often involved the trafficking of drugs, including high-grade marijuana and cocaine, through strategic routes such as the infamous I-75 corridor. The use of secret tunnels and military-style weapons obtained from cartel connections in the United States and Mexico demonstrated the cunning tactics employed by these criminal groups to evade law enforcement. Despite concerted efforts by law enforcement, challenges remained in dismantling these criminal networks fully. The lack of concrete evidence and the sophisticated methods used by the cartels to cover their tracks made it challenging for authorities to apprehend key figures, like the two cousins running the Flores Camargo cartel. While some cartels, like La Familia Michoacana, experienced experienced a decline in activity, new splinter groups and emerging criminal organizations continued to pose significant challenges to the security and stability of the region. With multi-agency investigations like Project Coronado and Project Delirium, authorities attempted to disrupt the operations of these complex criminal entities, highlighting the necessity of coordinated efforts in the fight against drug cartels in Mexico. Hell's Angels the Hell's Angels have long been a sight to see on American highways, riding on their flamboyant and beastly Harleys with long beards that state their allegiance to the Outlaw Motorcycle Group, which has several international ties. While the Hell's Angels is a motorcycle outlaw gang, some of its members have gone astray and worked alongside some of the biggest syndicates and even cartels. In this section, I will tell you about the story of two Hell's Angels who had the guts to stand up to Mexican cartels and had to pay a hefty price for this astounding act. Gordon Kendall and Jeffrey Ivan were two Canadians who were members of the Hell's Angels and were brought up in British Columbia, Canada. While staying in British Columbia, Ivans had been fined $1,000 for illicit drug trade and had a history of being involved with the consumption and distribution of drugs in the past. As stated by one of the closest friends of Ivans, he had gone to Mexico for some excavation-related work for the Hell's Angels and had second thoughts before going forward with this decision. Ivans's friend had told him to stay and not go in these nefarious paths as it could lead to something fatal. While in Mexico, Ivans and Douglas had been working on some real estate project while having other connections with the drug trade. This was seen as a hostile move by the local drug gangs, thus leading to retaliation that would ultimately seal their fates. On a cold night of January, Ivans and Douglas were spending their time near a posh resort located in the tourist town of Puerto Vallarta. The Jalisco region has been a hotbed of drug activities with the rise of the CJang, or the New Generation Jalisco Cartel, one of the most violent cartels in Mexican cartel history. According to the police records, Ivan and Douglas were staying in a condo opposite the resort, where two gunmen approached their doors and shot Douglas at first sight. Ivans had managed to run, but only as far as the pool area, where the gunmen sealed his fate. The men were shot first by a lone gunman, and when near death, were approached by a second gunman who shot them their lifeless bodies several times to make sure nothing remains of the two. This caused a stir in international news as both of them were civilians killed in a foreign country. After investigations began, the local police told media agencies that they had knowledge about both of them having ties with the drug trade and the deaths are a matter of settling scores for some activity done by these two. To be fair to Ivans and Douglas, they are not the first US gang members to try and get linked with drug trade out of Mexico. As a matter of fact, ties between Mexican cartels and US gangs are not new. Gangs operating near the southwestern border have long bought products from Mexican groups for US-based street sales. However, these relationships have been expanding geographically and evolving, particularly since 2006, the year that marked the start of former President Felipe Calderón's frontal assault on the cartels. These alliances are, in part, the result of a changing criminal landscape in Mexico. With major cartels weakening and fragmenting, new smaller groups have emerged to challenge their 
hegemony. Consequently, the cartels have had to seek out alternative revenue streams and new alliances. For instance, the Zetas, who used to rival the Sinaloa cartel, have formed a tenuous alliance with the Zetas' former bosses in the Gulf cartel. Reports of new alliances have also emerged between old cartels and newer criminal groups, with agents from the Beltran Leva organization, BLO, allegedly meeting with Knights Templar contacts. Developing collaborative relationships with gangs on the U.S. side of the border is the logical next step in this process. The states bordering Mexico, key entry points for drugs shipped north, are prime locations for this expansion. According to a 2011 Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI report, the Sinaloa cartel maintains business ties with gangs based in California, Arizona, and Texas border states. California's major cities, in particular, have become crucial transit points for methamphetamine and heroin trafficking. An estimated 70% of foreign-produced methamphetamine consumed in the U.S. is first trafficked through San Diego. The region has also become a significant marijuana production center for Mexico's cartels and a hotspot for money laundering. Both reports emphasize the fluidity of these relationships and the central role that mutual business interests play. However, there is a notable case in Texas that illustrates how deep these ties can potentially go. Barrio Azteca. This gang originated in the Texas prison system but expanded across the border into Mexico, developing a relationship with the Juarez cartel. Barrio Azteca provided manpower for the cartel's armed wing, La Linea, during their conflict against the Sinaloa cartel for control of Juarez. Over time, the gang gained control over local drug distribution in its own right. MS-503 Let's start from the beginning. The MS-503 is a dissident faction within the notorious MS-13 gang in El Salvador. It is mentioned by the security ministry, but is not known to have a significant presence in neighborhoods and districts of the country. Carlos Humberto Rodriguez Burgos, known as Shy Boy, is an ex-gang member from the MS-13 who left Zacatecoluca prison in January 2017 after serving an 18-year sentence. He gained his freedom in July of the same year. He claims to represent the MS-503 and has appeared in videos as its spokesperson. Shy Boy's body is covered in tattoos, showcasing his gang affiliation. He often appears shirtless in his videos, displaying his tattoos that climb up his torso, arms, and neck. Notably, he has prominent M and S tattoos on his forehead. Shy Boy is not a well-known figure in the media or official circles. He is not a national leader within the MS-13, and he was not part of the gang truce negotiated with the government in the past. Despite his lower profile, Shy Boy has taken on the role of being the most visible face of the MS-503 faction. He has released videos in which he speaks on behalf of the MS-503, issuing messages that include avoiding involvement in politics, elections, and urging the gang to cease attacks on police and soldiers. Shy Boy's past includes a conviction for killing another inmate in a juvenile prison, and he was transferred to Zacatecoluca prison in June 2010, where leaders of the three main gangs operating in El Salvador are held. In January 2017, Shy Boy and a group of at least 22 MS-13 members calling themselves leaders of the 503 program managed to convince authorities to move them to communal prisons. This move was in exchange for dividing the gang into two factions, akin to a tactic previously used by their rival gang, Barrio 18. Shy Boy appeared in an initial video filmed between January and July 2017 from Ciudad Barrios prison, where he claimed to represent a parallel faction dissatisfied with the decisions made by the traditional leadership of the MS-13. The emergence of Shy Boy as a prominent figure within the MS-503 faction unfolds through a series of videos, each encapsulating a distinct facet of the faction's message and aspirations. In the first video, a collective of 22 MS-503 members, including Shy Boy, stand united in an undisclosed location, their identities concealed by hats and balaclavas. With the absence of shirts, their tattoo-adorned bodies stand as silent testaments to their allegiance. Amidst this enigmatic gathering, Shy Boy's tattoos are especially pronounced, notably the M and S etched onto his forehead. Their introduction consists of each member stating their gang nickname name and the clique they belong to, amplifying the sense of unity and purpose that the MS-503 faction embodies. While Shy Boy's presence in this video doesn't immediately stand out, his journey through this clandestine transformation takes root here. The second video takes a dramatic turn, with Shy Boy assuming a solitary stance. Holding a weapon with purposeful rigidity, he exudes an air of defiance against a backdrop of fellow gang members shrouded in secrecy. Shy Boy addresses the Salvadoran people directly, disassociating the MS-503 from 
violent acts and contrasting their mission with the traditional MS-13 leadership, scornfully dubbed the MS Truce. Through eloquent rhetoric, he condemns extortion, violence against civilians, and political entanglement. This video marks the initiation of Shy Boy's role as the MS-503's vocal representative, offering a distinct perspective within the gang narrative that challenges established norms. In the third video, Shy Boy's presence gains further prominence. Positioned amidst a similar backdrop, he stands alongside a fellow gang member who partially conceals his identity with sunglasses and a hat. Their shirtless torsos bear witness to their shared commitment. Shy Boy's demeanor suggests a sense of gravitas as he reads from a notebook, addressing a narrower audience, the homeboys of the international MS-13. Reiterating the faction's stance against political involvement and negotiations with politicians, Shy Boy's voice resonates with clarity. He castigates those who engage in such actions as rats, emphasizing the importance of remaining true to the gang's original values. Interestingly, Shy Boy acknowledges the presence of good examples among MS-13 members in other countries, signifying the global dimensions of the gang's narrative. Shy Boy's journey began with his transfer from Ciudad Barrios to Izalco Prison in July 2017, accompanied by fellow MS-503 members. This marked a pivotal juncture as the faction's emergence found its voice and representation in Shy Boy. These videos released with an aura of secrecy and defiance, serve as a testament to the faction's determination to challenge the established leadership's direction. Shy Boy's ascent to prominence embodies the gang's evolving narrative, an embodiment of rebellion against traditional norms within the notorious MS-13. The tensions and dissent brewing within El Salvador's notorious MS-13 gang have taken an abrupt and violent turn, transcending national boundaries and culminating in a chilling incident on the streets of Mexico City. The assassination of Carlos Humberto Rodriguez Bur Burgos, the enigmatic figure known as Shy Boy, is a stark testament to the far-reaching implications of the internal strife within the gang. This unsettling event signals that the schism between the established MS-13 leadership and the splinter group MS-503 has now spilled over into the heart of the Mexican capital. On that fateful day, March 1st, Shy Boy met his demise as he sat in a taxi ensnared in the heavy traffic of Mexico City's Portal's neighborhood. While his stature within the gang's hierarchy might have been relatively modest, his influence and notoriety were significantly amplified due to his role as the outspoken mouthpiece of the MS-503 faction. This faction, a dissident offshoot of the MS-13, had vociferously decried the gang's reliance on brutality and violence in El Salvador. The MS-503, a group denoted by the reference to El Salvador's international telephone code was distinguished by its consistent message, a plea for restraint in the use of violence against civilians and law enforcement officers, along with a fervent call to abandon egregious practices such as extortion, rape, and civilian kidnappings. What further set them apart was their unyielding stance against the gang's involvement in political matters or electoral activities within the country. While the MS-13's footprint in Mexico is not an entirely new revelation, with reports of its activities tracing back to late 2017, Shy Boy's calculated assassination serves as a striking departure from mere presence. This meticulously orchestrated act appears to be more than a reaction to Shy Boy's confrontational rhetoric against the MS-13 leadership in Instead, it underscores the reach of the gang, extending its influence into the very fabric of Mexico City, a stark indication that the feud between the MS-13 and its splinter faction has transcended national borders. However, amidst this chilling backdrop, it's crucial to assess the larger picture. Mexico's criminal landscape is a complex tapestry woven with a multitude of drug cartels and criminal entities, making the establishment of a substantial MS-503 foothold unlikely. The MS-13 gang's violent turmoil continues as a brutal campaign to eliminate suspected informants has been ongoing since 2016. This means that the gang's leaders are targeting members they believe are providing information to authorities. Shockingly, even a rule that used to protect family members from harm has been discarded, leading to innocent people being targeted. The violence within the gang has reached alarming levels, reminding many of the intense violence during El Salvador's civil war. Despite efforts to control violence, El Salvador remains one of the most dangerous countries. The situation has become so bad that it's comparable to the violence violence during the long civil war that ended in 1992. Recently, there was an attempt to start talks to address the violence. 
However, the MS-13 and another gang called Barrio 18 were left out of these discussions. Both gangs wanted to be part of the talks, even suggesting church groups as mediators to help find solutions. The story of the MS-13 is not just about El Salvador, it's also connected to the United States. The gang was formed in the 1980s in Los Angeles, as many Salvadorans were fleeing their country's civil war. The gang's history is tied to the complicated relationship between the US and El Salvador. Although some members have been sent back to El Salvador, the MS-13 still has a presence in the US, Mexico, and Central America. Los Antrax Jose Rodrigo Arechiga Gamboa, born on June 15, 1980, and commonly known as El Chino Antrax, was a Mexican drug lord with a notorious reputation. He was not only a skilled hitman, but also held a high-ranking position within the Sinaloa Cartel, a criminal group based in the Sinaloa region of Mexico. El Chino Antrax was a prominent figure in the criminal underworld. He played a significant role in leading and establishing a group called Los Antrax. This armed enforcement unit was responsible for safeguarding Ismael El Mayo Zambada, a prominent figure within the Sinaloa cartel, as well as his sons. This group's main function was to provide protection and carry out violent actions on behalf of the cartel. In a tale of high-stakes betrayal that sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld, Jose Rodrigo Arechiga Gamboa, famously known as El Chino Antrax, played a surprising role. He was a big shot in the powerful Sinaloa cartel, calling the shots and making things happen. But then, something drastic happened that changed everything. Back in the early 2010s, the US Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, launched a daring plan called Operation Narco Polo. It aimed to bring down the Sinaloa cartel's drug deals and money laundering schemes happening in San Diego, California. This operation was like a chess game, where they intercepted phone calls and gathered hidden clues to take down the big players. At first, it seemed like the the bad guys had the upper hand. The operation hit a wall and wasn't getting results. But then, in late 2013, a game-changing moment occurred. Serafin Zambada Ortiz, the son of a bigwig named El Mayo, got caught in Arizona. And just a little while later, on a day that seemed ordinary, Jose Rodrigo Arechiga Gamboa, El Chino Antrax, was snatched up in Amsterdam and shipped off to the United States. What makes this twist in the story so crazy is that El Chino Antrax decided to flip sides. He spilled the beans to the US cops, telling them all the secrets he knew about the Sinaloa cartel. It was like a bombshell in the criminal world. This guy, who was once one of the cartel's big shots, started singing like a canary to the police. His inside scoop wasn't just juicy gossip, it was a game changer. The police got the lowdown on how the cartel worked, who the big shots were, and how they pulled off their illegal activities. This wasn't just about El Chino Antrax saving his own skin, it was like he turned traitor against his own gang. His betrayal had a domino effect. The US cops used his info to make big moves. Gangs got busted, drug deals got disrupted, and the whole criminal world got a shakeup. It's like he pulled the rug out from under his former gangmates, leaving them scrambling. In the end, El Chino Antrax made a choice that changed everything. He decided to look out for himself, and that sent shockwaves through the cartel. It's a story that shows how loyalties can shift, and how one person's decision can turn everything upside down in the world of crime. This wasn't uncommon for the Los Antrax group, who had beef with other cartels in the past and caused havoc in the streets of Mexico in their service to the Sinaloa cartel. One of the earliest clashes that brought Los Antrax in into the spotlight occurred in 2010 in the town of Tubutama, Sonora. A brutal gunfight erupted between Sinaloa cartel members backed by Los Antrax and members of the Beltran Leva cartel who had the support of Los Zetas. The clash left around 30 people dead and showcased the deadly territorial battles for control of lucrative drug routes. Los Antrax's reputation for violence continued to grow. However, it wasn't just rival cartels that they clashed with. Internal power struggles within the Sinaloa cartel also led to violent confrontations. In November 2011, Francisco Arce Rubio, a high-ranking leader of Los Antrax, was assassinated during an indoor soccer game in Culiacan. This event was believed to be a result of tensions between different factions within the cartel. But Los Antrax's conflicts weren't limited to just violence against rivals. The group also faced allegations of human rights abuses. In May 2011, members of Los Antrax were confronted by the Mexican army in Culiacan. Though preliminary reports suggested that the members died in a gunfight, post-mortem examinations revealed signs of torture. This incident shed light on the brutal tactics employed by Los Antrax. In addition to these clashes, Los Antrax also found themselves at odds with other factions within the Sinaloa cartel. In early 2012, the DEA launched Operation Narco Polo to target drug dealers and money laundering tied to the Sinaloa cartel. The operation involved intercepting phone calls and gathering evidence against key players. As a result, many members of the cartel, including El Chino Antrax himself, were exposed and targeted. Despite being a powerful enforcer for the Sinaloa cartel, Los Antrax faced internal strife 
and external pressure. This mix of conflicts showcased the complex and dangerous landscape of Mexican drug cartels, where power struggles, rivalries, and shifting alliances played out in bloodshed and violence. Los Mazatlecos, the grim sight that met the eyes of passers-by on Jacarandas Avenue in Tepic, Nayarit. Lying. Three lifeless bodies suspended by the neck swung from a bridge. The chilling scene was made even more unsettling by the presence of a stark white banner, starkly contrasting against the darkness, bearing the ominous signature Los Mazatlecos. This criminal organization hails from the northern Sinaloa region. In bold, uncompromising black ink, the banner bore a haunting message. This is going to happen to all the Falcons that work or support the puppets of the A-Team. Swiftly, authorities roped off the area, and a team of firefighters and the forensic medical service took charge of the grim scene. Emerging from the heart of Mazatlan, Sinaloa, Los Mazatlecos originally rallied around Alfredo Beltran Leva, only to shift allegiances after his 2008 arrest. Their loyalty transferred to Hector Beltran Leyva, the reigning head of the Beltran Leyva cartel. This allegiance plunged them into a fierce rivalry with the powerful Sinaloa cartel, triggering a tumultuous battle for dominance. Their actions have rippled through communities, causing widespread chaos, countless deaths, and numerous kidnappings across Sinaloa and Durango. With unwavering resolve, Los Mazatlecos have risen from obscurity to challenge the prevailing influence of the Beltran Leyva organization. According to the Mexican Attorney General's office, fear has driven approximately 2,600 individuals in Sinaloa to flee their communities due to the escalating violence and torment orchestrated by organized crime. These unfortunate individuals are often coerced into cultivating drugs or producing synthetic substances. In light of the dire circumstances, families have chosen to abandon 43 communities across five Sinaloan municipalities, opting not to rely on a passive state government that seemingly remains aloof to their plight. Amidst the criminal power struggles, the rupture between the Sinaloa cartel and the Beltran Leva in 2008 has led to a grim toll. In the ongoing rivalry, 1,099 executions have already taken place this year. In 2011, the death toll from confrontations stood at 2,041, and in 2010, a staggering 2,269 lives were claimed by the violent feud between criminal organizations. The struggle for dominance continues, painting a bleak picture of the complex and tumultuous criminal landscape that grips certain regions of Mexico. Los Mazatlecos has been associated with the Beltran Leyva Cartel one of the major drug trafficking organizations in Mexico. The group has been known to engage in violent confrontations with rival cartels and criminal factions, including the Sinaloa cartel and its various subgroups. One significant incident involving Los Mazatlecos occurred in November 2011, when they were reportedly responsible for killing Francisco Arce Rubio, a leader of Los Antrax, a heavily armed enforcement group affiliated with the Sinaloa cartel. This event highlighted the rivalries and conflicts that can erupt within and between different criminal organizations in Mexico. The name Los Mazatlecos refers to the group's origin in Mazatlan. The organization's activities and operations often revolve around the city and its surrounding areas, using it as a base for their criminal endeavors. Like other criminal groups in Mexico, Los Mazatlecos's activities have contributed to the overall violence and instability in the region. The dynamics of these groups, their interactions with law enforcement, and their rivalries with other criminal organizations underscore the complex and dangerous nature of organized crime in Mexico. And there you have it a closer look at the gangs that dared to defy the Mexican cartels. Each of these groups carved out their own path of resistance against the backdrop of powerful criminal organizations. From self-defense units emerging from local communities to newly formed gangs challenging the established order, these stories shed light on a different side of Mexico's struggle against organized crime. And that's a wrap for today. If you're intrigued by stories brimming with intrigue and defiance, don't hesitate to click on another video on your screen for more captivating content.